Good evening, councillors. Welcome to a new decade. Uh, general announcements. Uh, fire alarm, if there's any strangers here, if you hear the fire alarm, exit over there or to the left, to my left over here. Please make sure your mobile phones are either switched off or on silent. And can all members check there if there's any post in their pigeonhole in the members' lounge? This meeting will be filmed for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site. The whole of this meeting will be filmed except where there are confidential or exempt items which are being considered in the absence of the press and public. By entering the Council chamber and using the public seating areas, you are consenting to being filmed. If this presents any difficulty, please inform Democratic Services. Um, can you all make sure that your uh, delegate card is pushed in the, in, so you should have your name facing you. And when you speak, speak into the microphone, Doina. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, that's that, I think. Off we go. All right. Apologies. Do you have any apologies? Yes, Stephen. Yes, we have um, apologies from Jill Oxley, whose father is unwell, so she's had to go to Newcastle. Dave Mossman, who is unwell. Gordon Craig, who is unwell. Um, also, Dorcas Binns, Phil McCasey, and Chas Fellows. All right. I'm sorry to hear that. And yes, Diana. I'm scared now. I'm going to do this right. Um, so, um, Councillor Hall and uh, Chris Bryan, I think, will be here, but he's running late. Okay. The Greens, anyone? Uh, Jonathan Edmonds has got a, a family issue, so he couldn't come. Right. Um, I think um, Karen McEwen might come, but later, because she's right. on a train, as I understand it, and Sue Reid is also not able to come. Right. Thank you, Martin. Right. Simon. Simon. I I'm, may have to nip out uh, join the meeting. I've uh, been asked to do a live uh, Skype interview with the BBC. Peace. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Quiet. I did try to change it, but I wasn't afraid. Thank you, Chair. I just think for the benefit of the webcam and people looking in, we should make it clear that this was a meeting that had to be put in the calendar, which wasn't planned. Right. And that is why quite a number of people haven't been able to attend, and therefore it does look like councillors don't care. I'm sure they do. Any declaration of interest? No? Minutes? Have you all read the minutes of the last meeting? Are you happy with them? Do you wish me to sign them? A show of hands, please. Thank you, councillors. Announcements? I have none, but the leader has, I believe. Thank you very much, Chair. I have two announcements. So, um, first of all, um, we have the local transport plan, which is obviously the plan which the county has put together, but the draft is out for consultation, and the, sh the launch of that was held at Shire Hall today, and there are going to be stakeholder consultation events held throughout the county at all the district and borough councils. If you check your members' weekly update, you can get the details, but just to remind you, for Stroud, it will be Thursday the 13th of February, and there'll be daytime surgeries in the reception area from 11 till 3 for any members of the public. So please do share that with anyone you know who'd like to input into that plan. And, um, but also there will be a, a presentation with questions and answers from 4 o'clock in the council chamber, which is for all members and officers. So it is a really important plan which affects us all qu quite um, closely. And there's some really good stuff in there about particularly local areas definitely worth having a look at. So I encourage you all to attend that. The other announcement, which I think you also had some information in your weekly members update, is um, I'm inviting all members and officers to attend a remembrance event on Monday the 22nd of January in the Council Chamber to commemorate um, Holocaust Memorial Day, which is on that day. It's taking place at 1.30. It should only last for about half, a, uh, half an hour so that officers can attend during their lunch break. 
If you're not aware what Holocaust Memorial Day is, it's the National Commemoration Day, which is dedicated to the remembrance of those who suffered in the Holocaust under Nazi persecution and subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. And this year is particularly um, important that we commemorate it because it's 20, 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and the 25th anniversary of the genocide in Bosnia. So if you are able to spare half an hour during the day, I very much appreciate your attendance um, at that. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joey. And now, uh, Chief Executive, I think you have some names. Thank you very much, Chair. I also have two announcements. Um, the first is about the timetable for the elections in May, which is probably quite useful just to run through with you. It has been published in the Members' Weekly Update, but I just wanted to point out that the elections this year are for the Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire, all district councillors and all parish and town councillors. To stand as a candidate in these elections, nomination papers must be submitted between the 24th of March and the 8th of April. You're probably aware that due to the change in the bank holiday this year, the uh, May bank holiday due to take place on May, Monday, May the 4th, has been switched to Friday the 8th of May to commemorate the 75th anniversary of VE Day, that's Victory in Europe Day. Um, that means that we've got some particular issues around the elections this year, which of course are taking place on Thursday the 7th of May. What that means is that the ward count, the district ward count, will take place overnight on the 7th of May, but that the count for the police and crime commissioner and for the parish councillors will be held on Monday the 11th of May. Both of those counts, all of those counts, will be held at Stratford Park Leisure Centre. So my second announcement is a, is, um, a very happy one for me, and that is to say that I've got two of my new strategic directors in the room, Andrew Cummings, who you're very familiar with, but on day nine, uh, we've got Brendan Clear, our new strategic director of place. So Brendan, I don't know if you just want to stand up so that the members can see who you are. Thank you very much. Um, we also have a third director who's already with us, Karen Starkey, our new strategic director of change and transformation, but she is having an operation, so she's not here to, with us tonight, and she'll be away for a week or so due to that. And we have our final director, Keith Gerrard, is going to start with us on the 2nd of March. So I'll be delighted when we've got the full team, but great to have you, you with us tonight, Brendan. Thanks for coming back for week two. Thank you. <laughs> Right, there are, I'm told there are no public questions, so we'll move on to item six. Uh, Councillor Cornwell, you are going to move this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, I am going to introduce this item, but I think this goes for this, this item on the agenda plus the second item. I would just like to say this is very much down to the hard work of Hannah Emery, who's really put two really good reports Absolutely. together. So although I am actually um, presenting it, I think very much the credit for this goes to you and all the hard work you've done, and your team as well, who've been working really hard, and you've got a lot coming your way as well in the next few months as well. Um, so just to sort of give you a bit of background to the report, is it, it is a very detailed report, and as you'll see in there, there's a lot of... Um, information around all the polling stations, consultation, comments. So although I'm happy to take questions, I think if you've got any particular concerns or issues that you want to raise about specific polling stations, I'll do my best, but it might be helpful that we can refer those back to Hannah if there's things that you feel you'd like to address in that. Um, just to give you some of the background to it, we have to conduct a, and complete a polling district and polling place review by the end of January 2020. The last review of this was undertaken in 2016. And because we've had the boundary um, change as a result of the community governance review, which we looked at at the end of last year, there are some necessary changes that we need to make to the polling district boundaries. A consultation was held between August and October 2019. And as you can see, um, you can find the comments in the, in the um, company papers. All of the changes um, which are recommended there um, to the polling district boundaries are the result of the community governance review. And these changes are vital to ensure that our polling district boundaries and parish boundaries are aligned. Amendments to any of the venues for polling stations are the result of previous venues no longer being available or suitable. And when we consider where we're going to put polling stations, we do take into account the location within the district, any facilities, and of course, most importantly, disabled access. 
The majority of our polling stations are well established within the electoral community and um, we're probably very familiar with where they are. Um, and in 2019, we held two national elections using the polling stations recommended in the schedule. Other than some minor issues with heating at a small number of stations in the December elections, all polling stations have venues have provided um, adequate facilities for the electorate and the polling station staff. And I think overall, having spoken to Hannah about this, it, considering how complicated it was and the fact it was a winter election, I know you had lots of plans in place in the event of bad weather. It, it all went off very smoothly. The changes to the polling uh, districts will come into effect for the local and PCC elections in May and changes will be made to the February electoral registers. Um, so there will be a new register, I think, which is coming out on the 1st of February, which will be the most up-to-date uh, so far. I've got some definitions here. If, if people want, I could go into the details, but if you do want me to, to read out what the definition of a polling district is, Norm shaking his head, polling place and polling station. I think you're all familiar with polling stations, which is where the vote takes place. The polling place is the building uh, which the polling station is allocated to. And, um, and the polling district is the geographical area created by the subdivision of the constituency. So we all sort of go in our own individual polling districts. Um, that's probably um, as much as I'll say on that. I'm just happy to take any questions, Chair. Do you have a seconder? Yes, Martha. Do you wish to speak now? Sorry, any questions? Yes, Stephen. Uh, I'm going to ask a question which just only shows my ignorance, but I'm quite happy to do that. Um, but I did just want to add that, I mean, there's a huge amount of work done here, and, and um, clearly um, much of it is a level of detail we don't normally get into. But my, my first question, and I had a sort of request, my first question is, is there been any, are we allowed to consolidate more polling stations? We do seem to have a huge number, and quite a lot with quite small um, numbers connected to them. I just wondered whether... Um, even if we're allowed to, as I'm just showing my ignorance. And then the, the second one is more sort of a request. I think in the um, December election, certainly I know we did, and I suspect all, um, other parties did, um, probably did telling in, in more polling stations than we normally do. And we found an inconsistency of advice to the people managing the polling stations. Those where we regularly turn up knew how to treat us and, and were incredibly charming and helpful in most cases. But in some of the other cases, there seemed to be some confusion. So I wonder if I could ask that in the May election, there is some guidance given as to um, what tellers, what we can do to accommodate tellers when possible, particularly in inclement weather, understanding all the legal restrictions. Thank you. I'll answer the second one. The other one's a bit of a technical one. I might have to defer to Hannah. If, do you want to take that one first? About the cons is, Hannah, is it okay for you to answer about the consolidation and answer the second question? Is that okay? So the number of polling stations are based on our number of polling districts, which, as you know, in Stroud, we have quite a few um, parishes, which are, a lot of them are warded. So most of our polling districts fit within our parish wards. We have to have a polling station for each parish ward. Otherwise, we'd have um, at one polling station potential for two ballot papers for those parish wards. Uh, so we try, and, and at our last polling district view in 2016, we did consolidate and reduce the amount of polling stations that we have. We can't really reduce them any further, although for our um, district elections, districts and parish elections in May, they actually do grow because of the number of parish wards that we have to take into account. So in the general election, we had um, 88 polling stations, but we will be looking at about 104 for May. I'll just respond to the other one because I did have a conversation with Hannah about this and obviously we do have the training which takes, or the briefing rather, which takes place for all the candidates and the agents and obviously telling is one thing that's discussed but I think Hannah sort of reflected on the experiences and obviously councillors have fed stuff back to her so I think we agreed that should be also part of the briefing just to make it very clear from the teller's point of view, um, sorry from the agent's point of view what needs to be done and also to ensure that, that the, the, those messages are communicated out to tellers. Um, you get some tellers who've done it umpteen times before, for some it's quite new. And so there's some things, for example, we had a conversation around rosettes, there's some rules around that. You can have a rosette, but it's got to be plain without the candidate's name on. So just to be sure that people are quite clear on, on what the rules are. But equally, it's very important that the, um, the clerks who are in charge of those polling stations are also have the right briefing. I think, I think Kathy put quite a lot, and Hannah put quite a lot of thought into it this time. 
Bearing in mind the wintry weather, I think the accommodation was made for most people to be going to the porches, which I thought worked quite well. But I think, obviously, it's always useful after an election to reflect on what could be done better. And if we feel there is an inconsistency of how tellers are treated, we should need to look at that and make sure it's not just the briefings for the candidates and agents, but also the, the people um, that they do um, have that right. Someone made the point that in one of the polling stations there was a very nice, clear sign explaining to voters who the tellers are and what they're doing, but we need to check that's consistent across the board because obviously some people vote coming to arrive get confused, they don't really know what their role is. So that's, I think we take that on board and take that way and make sure it's clear for future reference. I should also say that this is quite a, because of the district, also the parish and town councils, I think I didn't make the point in the introduction, you have add, allowed an extra week for nominations because we're probably looking at about 500 nominations coming in because all the town and parishes have got to nominate even if they're not contested. So that's a phenomenal amount of work and you just said extra polling stations so there's a lot of work that the um, officers here are going to have to take on board. Nigel. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick one. The community governance review that we agreed uh, in Council last year, I believe after we agreed it, we said that had to be sent up to Westminster for them to, to agree. Have, have we had that agreement back? Have I just missed it, please? We have written to um, the Local Government Boundary Commission for England. We haven't had a response yet. Um, but the changes that we're making to our parishes they don't need to necessarily agree to those. We just need to let them know that there's consequential recommendations. So, so I can tell the gentleman in Cranham, who keeps pestering me, that, uh, <laughs> that um, he can now move from Upton St. Leonard's to uh, Cranham. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Any debate? Right. No, it's fine. It's actually not a debate. It's a, just a, a comment um, just to say that under the Thrupp Ward, the text that talks about the transfer of 47 properties from Gun House Lane isn't to the Rodwell Ward. It is to the, the Brimscombe and Thrupp Division 1. It's just in the wrong line, and uh, Han Hannah's aware of it and will be corrected in the final version, just to, for the benefit of the webcam. Anyone else wish to speak in debate? No. Yeah. Need to, I need to move the decision now. So, yeah, before we go to debate. Oh, you've got it. You don't yeah. want to read it out. Okay. Do you want Do Donia to read out the? You've got it there on the screen. So, can we go? Can we go to the vote then, please. Thank you, everyone. Item 7, appointment of the Independent Renumeration Panel. Councillor Cornwall, again. Thank you very much. Um, I've already paid tribute to Hannah, so we won't do that again, but also uh, thank you for that. Um, Hannah's put a lot of work into this. When the last um, panel was held, or sorry, when the last review of allowances was held, she wasn't working here, so she's really gone back, looked at how we did it last time, and made some recommendations on how we can do it um, going forward. So this report is uh, for the appointment of the panel members, and it sets out um, that we need to appoint a panel in order to review the scheme of allowances for members by May 2020. Um, the last scheme of allowances was approved in 2016 and it did state that we were going to review it at this time. So that's why that decision to do the review isn't in the decision box because it was a decision that the council's already made, just to make that clear. The purpose of the independent remuneration panel, in, which is standard for, for councils, is to review the allowances paid for basic special responsibility, dependents, carers, travelling and subsistence, parental leave um, and ICT allowance and recommend a new scheme for the council to approve. The report recommends that the panel is shared with Gloucester City IRP. Um, this is because it can be difficult to recruit panel members and um, we did previously pay for our independent members and as you'll see in the paper, we're saying now we're going to make that a voluntary role. So there is a small saving of a few thousand pounds for the council in adopting this new approach. But it is quite difficult to recruit um, good quality panel members 
And so that's why going in with Gloucester City, it does mean we have the, like, the more chance of um, having a, a, quali a good quality of panel members. And it's recommended, as I say, that these are voluntary positions with the expenses to be reimbursed. It's important to stress that this is a joint recruitment exercise and we are using the same panel members, but it's not a joint panel. We're about to conduct the review of our, of our allowances, but Gloucester is not conducting a review um, for the moment. And it, when they do conduct a review, it will be completely se separate from ours. I don't think they're intended to conduct a review for a, a couple of years. So that's quite important that we're not doing that at the same time. As it says in the report, the rec recommended panel consists of two panellists, Stuart Dove and Wynne Bartlett, that already sit on Gloucester City's panel. And the other, two, the other two, Graham Russell and J J Jason Jones, are recommended for appointment after submitting an application during the recruitment exercise that took place in autumn last year. And you've got a little sort of pen portrait of their experience there. And if they are appointed this evening, we'll have an extremely experienced IRP panel to conduct the review. Stuart Dove and Wynne Bartlett have been appointed to Gloucester City for three years. And Graham Russell is a retired Democratic Services Manager from Bath and North East Somerset. And he's been um, appointed to a number of IRPs across the South West since his retirement. And having had a conversation with Hannah beforehand, she's feeling very um, confident that we've got a really, really good quality um, of, of caliber of, of IRP members if we adopt that this evening. So the review will consist of a survey to all members. So um, there'll be an invitation going out, which all members are invited to get involved with and meet with the panel. There'll be a detailed analysis, and there'll also be a comparison done with all the Gloucestershire-based councils and other committee-based councils, and also councils with a similar makeup to Stroud Council. So we've got a good benchmarking as, as to uh, what sort of thing we should be looking at. And there will be interviews with members so that members have the opportunity to meet with the panelists if they wish to do so. And I would encourage members, obviously, to take part in that so we have a good uh, contribution from members. So the, um, in the report, we did, um, there is a sort of schedule of the, the review and how it would take place. Um, but the feeling is that although we've said in there that it should report back in April, um, this does, would actually mean that the review and the recommendation would fall right into the short election campaign period. And we want this to be an independent review, which is done as is quite right, um, independent of members. Um, make, obviously, the members make the final de decision to adopt it, but they don't, make the, they don't come up with the recommendations. So um, having discussed this with the monitoring officers, if this would be suitable, I'd like to have it minuted, and if members will accept that, that we would um, recommend that the review um, reports back after April, but within the sort of time frame that's most appropriate. So would likely to be May, um, the May AGM, but that would have to be dependent on, on whether we were in the right place at the right time to do that. So that's something I'd like to be noted so that um, as the review gets underway, we have that flexibility with the time scale. Um, happy to take any questions. Do I have a seconder? Chaz, you're going to... Chaz, do you want to speak now? No. Any questions? Stephen. I would always hate to be accused of being a pedant, but <laughs> um, it says, it, it, thank you, group leaders were consulted, um, and I don't, unless I missed something or fell asleep in a meeting, I don't think I was actually consulted. Uh, I just sort of hope that was an oversight and that certainly going forward I'd like to be involved. Sorry, I do remember, I think in the summer an email was sent out to group leaders. I do remember receiving that and responding to it. it, it I don't think it came to a group leaders' meeting, but apologies if you saw I missed that. It happens to me all the time. You miss an input. So sorry, Stephen, but you, I, I, Hannah would back me up that an email was sent out to consult with all the group leaders on the principle for us to look at sharing with Gloucester City. So apologies if that was something I missed, but obviously, as we do with everything else, we'll be consulting with you fully going forwards in the review. Norman, and then John Marjorie. Thank you. It's just occurred to me do these independent panel members have any role in recommending allowances for parish and town councillors, which parish and town councils can choose whether or not they want to adopt? This is simply for the district council. I, that's probably a different question. I'm not sure that all parish or district, sorry, parish or town councils have allowances. I presume they'd have to set up a separate system, which has nothing to do with us, but. Yeah, this isn't involved in this, in this particular instance. It's just about the district. John? 
Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, do all these people actually live in the district? Because it may be different. If I, if I miss that, I'm apologising, but it does seem to me that you need people actually who know the area and the, the, you know, the funding of such. Um, but do they, actually, do they actually live in the district? Because somebody, anyone, Gloucester or something, wouldn't, wouldn't actually tie up what my view is. I'm not sure if they live in the district. I know that they're basically either in Gloucestershire or based in the southwest. So, I mean, that's a fair point. Um, I'm not sure it actually would have much impact if they're experienced, independent people that they should be coming at this. Um, but obviously, as members, it's our opportunity to put our own sort of, you know, knowledge of Stroud District to them when they look at their review. I can come back on that, but there must be areas which are quite rich and other parts quite poor. And it does seem to me that it, it should be a balanced thing with people who actually know financial situation in district council, which is sometimes, you know, it's a lot of people who go to London and everything, which is quite a people, and other poor people. But it does seem to me they do need to understand the area which they're going to represent. That's what I'm saying. That's the point that, that if you look at, obviously one of them is very experienced in the southwest, there's quite a lot of areas within the southwest which are quite similar to Stroud, a mixture of towns and rural areas, so I think that experience will come um, to bear on this review, so I think they'll have some understanding of the sort of place that we are. Any more questions? Charles, do you wish to speak now? Uh, I don't, you've got it up there on the on your screen up, so you do, you don't want that read out now, do you? No. Can we go to the vote then, please? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Eight now, I beg your pardon. Steve. Yeah. And when we go to the motion, we need to agree whether or not we're going to incorporate doing a suggestion to slip it to after uh, April. I'd heartily endorse that suggestion. I think it's important that knowing how uh, divergent many of us can be on matters such as this, I think it's, e it's important we actually take it outside the election. I also think it's important that the, this old council, no disrespect to people who are retiring, and you've all done a great service, and people who may lose in May, we shouldn't determine what's going to take place for the new council. And I would certainly look as well, I think, I would wish that we look at this in the context of what other measures, we're looking at one later on tonight about parental leave, what other measures we as a council need to, be, to undertake to look at how we can increase our diversity, particularly our age, our gender balance, people with disabilities and all the other issues which, to be frank, looking around here, we fail to embrace and we fail to serve. And it's something I think many of us raised, I certainly raised it time and again at the county council. I think I was the youngest when I got elected in 2013. Yeah, sure you know, I was only a boy <laughs> and I was about 53, you know. So these are serious issues and I do think we need to embrace looking at that. So I'd heartily endorse doing a suggestion. We take this out of the political domain and get their recommendation back and ask that the new council actually explores and determines this. So uh, I'd ask you to accept what Dawn has suggested. Any more debate? Oh, yeah. Just to say, that if, I think I mentioned it, but just to emphasise, if, if members feel they'd like a little bit more information, I want to look at the application forms of the independent members. They can speak to Hannah about doing that. Go to the vote, then. Right, thank you, members. Uh, item 8, uh, I'm told there are no members' questions, so we move on to 9A. And I believe Councillor Fryer and Councillor Cornwall are bringing this. Councillor Fryer. Thank you, Chair. Proposing the TUC Going to Work Charter, I would like to read this out. 
this charter sets out an agreed way in which our employees will be supported, protected and guided throughout their employment following a terminal diagnosis. We recognise that terminal illness requires support and understanding and not additional and avoidable stress and worry. Terminally ill workers will be secure in the knowledge that, they, that we will support them following their diagnosis and we recognise that safe and reasonable work can help maintain dignity, offer a valuable distraction and can be therapeutic in itself. We will provide our employees with the security of work, peace of mind and the right to choose the best course of action for themselves and their families, which helps them through this challenging period with dignity and most importantly and without undue final financial loss. So I would ask this ch chamber to support this charter so that all employees battling terminal illness have adequate employment protection and have their death in service benefits, again which is very important, protected for the loved ones they leave behind. Thank you Chair. Doina, do you wish to speak now? Any questions? Um, how can one but support in principle this sort of motion and I do but um, it does seem to me that I'm not sure that all the preparatory work has been done and I'm hoping that Councillor Fryer can reassure us um, I wonder for instance what discussions he has had with human resources and legal about the, the, the their view on it and what needs to be done to implement it and the final one I wonder is what does Councillor Fryer think about the possibilities of extending these requirements to our larger contractors when contracts come up for renewal? Thank you. I haven't had any discussions with HR or anyone else, Norman, because this charter, I cannot see how anyone could disagree with this charter, okay? And I really can't. The second question, I would agree in principle that we can look at contractors being, or large contractors being involved with this charter, but other than that, I would like to leave it at that, Norman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm slightly in the same frame of mind as Norman. Um, I, I would if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Can you please give us chapter and verse where this authority, as an employer, has fallen down on the job and uh, not shown the dignity that you're seeking within the paper that you're offering? I'd, um, if you could do that for me, please. I can't assure you of that at all. But what I can say is this is good practice. If the council do this now, great. But if not, then this charter needs to be agreed and it also needs to go out on webcam and to the public and employees that they are a caring council and they will follow this charter. Chief Exec wants to speak on this. Thank you. I think it might be helpful because I think a number of the questions are going to probably mirror questions already asked. And um, whilst it's true that Councillor Fryer is saying that he has not had any discussions with HR, it um, would of course not surprise you to know that we've had sight uh, of this particular motion and we have looked quite carefully to see how far it mirrors what we already do. I'm quite satisfied as Chief Executive that this pretty much mirrors what we already do. We already put um, the care of our employees very much at our heart. It is simply not badged as a dying to work charter in this way. So the difference is simply that we are formalizing pretty much what we already do. And it is actually a little extra protection for those um, who are 
unfortunate enough to receive a terminal diagnosis, a little bit of extra protection for them. But it, when we've looked at the application of our policies around those who unfortunately have been long-term sick or receive a terminal diagnosis, they choose different paths and we very much work with the individual about what they would like to do. So the last uh, case of a terminal diagnosis that the council had, the officer concerned chose to retire on ill health grounds. Others might choose to remain at work and want to remain at work, and we would, of course, support them to do that. Um, so I'm just saying that it, it, you know, we do take everything on a case-by-case -case basis. We are lucky enough that not too many of our staff have been in this unfortunate position, but of course we put their individual needs at the heart of our HR policies. John, you wish to speak? Can you tell me, please, if any part of this is actually in the Constitution already? Because it does seem to me we don't, we don't want to duplicate this, but have we actually looked through parts? I'm not, I'm, I will vote for it, but I'm just wondering if we know <laughs> how much of the Constitution we've dealt with about these issues. Can you tell, tell me, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is not a constitutional matter. It's a matter of the uh, terms and conditions that are set out in the staff handbook. Any more questions? No? Any debate? Yes. This is one of those interesting ones, isn't it? Um, nobody could possibly disagree with anything that's written here but I just deeply suspect we all do it. And actually, I think we know in, in our own um, time in this council, we've seen it implemented. So I go into this, are we doing this as a gesture? And I'm afraid that the proposal of this motion has demonstrated a lack of homework beforehand that suggests this is a gesture. And we've been here before, I'm going to say the word unite, and the amendment we brought forward that was voted down and then adopted um, over Grimscombe Port. And I'm going to tell you a story, because we're going to have plenty of time tonight, um, at, we could go home. At, at the count, it was very noticeable, there were a large number of people with Unite hoodies in the room. And, and, and I'm sure now we'll get more to UC help come the May election. What was interesting about that is apparently many of them were there with sub-agents because Hannafay kindly allowed us to appoint sub-agent. We appointed one. The um, Lay Party had 21 many of which were Unite members, probably motivated by a previous motion of gesture politics like this. I'd say our one was my wife, one versus 21 of the others. I think we were in a fair fight, so I have no complaint. Colin. You know, I really cannot understand this aversion to trade unions, because I could tell you, Kate, sir, if you came to me with this motion from the Employers' Federation or the CBI, I would welcome it completely. And I wouldn't argue where it came from. But unfortunately, these things don't. And that's why trade unions and the TUC bring them up. Thank you. Well done. Gabby? I'd like to say in the time that I've served on this council, we have unfortunately had two people that I've been working with who have had terminal um, diagnosis. And I have got to say, I think the way that they were looked after by this council and by their colleagues was absolutely admirable. And I'm sure um, they were very grateful for the way that they were treated. And there'll be a few people here who will remember that. But there's not many of us who will remember both of those cases. Um, I, would be, I was very proud to be a councillor and to see the treatment that those officers, officers got. Um, and I think as a council, we should be very proud of the way that we, we treated those officers. Matty and then Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't going to speak on this debate because um, I just think it's an admirable um, thing to do to um, uh, the chief exec has explained that we're doing most of this and to formalize it I think is sending out the right message. What, what I'm standing on my feet for now is to say I absolutely and completely deplore that this is being made into a political matter because it's not political. 
doing the right thing by people should be for right across the chamber, not just on this side. And to bring up the last count and hoodies is completely and utterly despicable in my view, Councillor Davis. Steve Lydon. Yeah, well, Matt has said it. You know, some of us try and work across the floor on things and thought we were immature, but that sort of trite comments was distinctly unwelcome. If that's the way you want to go, bring it on, mate. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, as leader and Debbie giving platitudes, we haven't had a consistent policy on some of these matters. And I certainly applied as leader some discretion, certainly at least one person, and I didn't like doing it because it, was, it could have been seen as a grace and favour type of way of doing things. And I don't work in that way. Others, of course, across the chamber do work in that way and accept a paternalistic methodology of doing things. It's right and proper we bring in a policy and we need to plan for the future. Of course, what happens in May may change all this and no doubt with the next five years of the Tory government we'll have a lot of the workers' rights that people like Colin have fought for over 100 years will be chucked into the bin. Well, I think, sadly, that it, I hope that many of us will resist this. So keep these petty politics, you know, whinging about the count and things like that. You know, I'm not a member of you know, I'm a member of Prospect. I'm a member of the co-op. I put it on my interests and I declare it there. It's quite interesting, though, when we talk about landlords and tenants, the last time we talked about that, I think half the other side of the chamber couldn't take part in the debate. Now, why was that? Oh, sorry, because you all own properties which you sublet to other people. So you want to play that game, mate, bring it on. But uh, let's rise above it and let's endorse the approach that Collins is proposing here. Thank you, Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll certainly rise above it. Um, from my experience on the Council of the past uh, 18 years, and uh, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with, with what's being proposed, and uh, particularly I'm reassured by hearing what the Chief Executive has to say, that in fact we probably do all this um, anyway, as, 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 a, as a very good employer. So um, I've got no problem with supporting this. Norman. Chair, when I was a senior steward, um, I represented somebody who was um, subject to a terminal illness, and it was a much more ruthless authority, not this one, of course, um, who insisted on um, requiring her to leave um, and I didn't get anywhere this is before the Disability Discrimination Act and before I could pass it on to our full-time union officials um, she chose to leave anyway and that's a trouble when you have somebody in that position they are quite vulnerable and if you get pressure from your employer um, then it's very easy just to um, quaver before it and I, I support this motion and I'll be glad to see it passed but I'll give you notice that if I'm still here when we come up to review contracts with our larger contractors I'll try to see that it's a requirement of those contracts Catherine Thank you Chair, I'm pleased to support this motion as well this evening um, I was just looking at the legal requirements this morning um, and Unfortunately, this is an issue that will affect a lot of people in the district who find themselves in, during their working lives faced with a, a terminal diagnosis. So one thing that I would hope would come from this debate and from the vote that we're going to have this evening is that more people in the district are aware of the legal provisions that are available to them. Um, and under the Equalities Act, if you are faced with a terminal diagnosis, it's likely that you'd be considered disabled and so, as a result, uh, your employer is unable to make you redundant during that period because of your disability, as it's classed. Um, I appreciate also that the Council has an excellent employee system um, programme in place, and many other companies do as well, even the smaller companies who might outsource that. And again, that's a source of <coughs> reference and uh, advice to people who may be facing these kind of issues. I think it's important that, as a Council, we can talk about these issues and signpost to residents um, and to people who maybe look to us for advice and look to the council for advice that there is support out there and that there are protections in place and these additional requirements that are being proposed through the Dying to Work Charter is something to look out for those people who are really facing a, a difficult situation. Chris. Thank you, Chair. I truly didn't believe there was even be a debate on this, Chair. 
I thought it would go straight through. It's the most sensible um, motion I've seen in the Chamber for a very long time. So I'm going to go old school, Chair. I'm going to ask if we can have this recorded vote, please, because I'd like to see the names of the people that did support it and those that didn't. Now, I know we've got an electronic system now, but we still have in our Constitution the facility that if members request it, then we can have a recorded vote, which is then put into the next minutes listed by their names and the way they voted. So I, I request that we have a recorded vote, Chair. Do you have support for that? <laughs> Can we have a show of hands so that, that we have a recorded vote? All right? All right, okay. Problem, do you? Sorry? Can I speak as a seconder before we go to the vote? We're starting to vote now. Oh, well, I didn't call me to speak. Can we stop? Yeah, I appreciate. Well, I indicated that I wanted to speak. And I've been left off. I'm sorry. Sorry, Keith, we missed you then. We haven't got you on the list. Do you want to speak? Do you wish to speak now? We stop the, stop the vote. I, I feel that in some way the motion should reflect in writing that this council has a policy. This council has a policy to treat people in this position in the way that it has and actually is part of what is there. I agree this does cement it in some way, but we do have that policy and it has been evidenced. Some people have been here longer, but as Debbie said, over 13 years, I know at least two people here have been treated fantastically by this council, and I think that should be reflected. Otherwise, it gives, I believe, the feeling that we don't do it, that we need a policy because we don't have one. Doina. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Just a couple of points to make. I mean, obviously taking on board what Keith just said. I mean, it does, it does say in here that the resolution is around reviewing sick pay and sickness absence procedures, so there is an ongoing opportunity there for, for officers to look at that and see that that's okay. Um, I don't really know if I should stoop to the depths of Stephen Davis's comments around the count, which seems really distasteful. I think we have to think there may be people in this chamber who themselves have been personally affected about what we're discussing this evening who may not want to speak out about that, so I think a little bit of respect for those sorts of people would be important. It was supposed to be uh, Trevor Hall who was supposed to be um, proposing this tonight and couldn't make it. He worked for many years for Unite and now he's retired. So the idea that someone could be wearing a hoodie, which perhaps is from their own workplace, seems to be really not worthy of note in this chamber. And I know pretty much all the people who were there from, our, um, from the Labour Party, they all either worked or lived in the constituency. I'm not sure if we can say the same for everyone who was attending from other parties. Um, I would like to make the point, you said had uh, Colin done his homework properly, and obviously you are also a county councillor. Well, the Gloucestershire County Council did adopt this charter on, on the 27th of September this last year. So if the county can do it, um, I'm sure that this district can do it. It's worth having a lo look at the long list of organisations which have adopted it, people like the Royal College of Nursing, many health organisations and trusts, police forces, companies like Hovis, so I think we're in very good company, and that just goes to show that it is an important um, gesture to make. Even if it is a gesture, gestures are some, sometimes quite significant, and it does set the tone. Catherine's point was well made, that it says exactly what we're about here. And also the point about the council doing this publicly, it means that it enables us to ensure this spreads better practice from other um, companies around the, the district who might be considering, who perhaps need to face up to something like that, if that's an issue which is coming around um, that they're faced with. So 
I'm very happy to, to um, support this motion tonight, Chair. Then we we'll go to the vote, which has been asked to be recorded. Thank you, members. We now move on to 9B. Councillor Curley, would you like to uh, outline your. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just waiting for the, the new resolution to come up that uh, is different to the resolution that was in the papers. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm happy, very happy to, support, uh, to propose this motion and just to uh, bring people's attention to the uh, slightly revised resolution that is there on the screen, which is different to the one that was circulated with the papers. Um, as the motion points out, women are underrepresented at all levels of politics, although the situation is slowly improving. They remain underrepresented as councillors and particularly as council leaders, although happily not in this council. Um, parental leave is important to all parents and it's been particularly highlighted as an issue affecting women's participation in local government. The model policy developed by the LGA Labour Group Task Force referred to in the motion sets out arrangements for six months maternity leave six months adoption leave and two weeks paternity leave and under the policy members would continue to receive their relevant allowances whilst on one of those forms of leave. A number of councils across England have agreed to introduce parental leave schemes for elected members including Corby, Southampton, Newcastle, Lincoln, Islington, Lambeth, Sunderland and Gloucestershire County Council. We will all have had conversations with friends and colleagues about getting more involved in local democracy and we all know that there are barriers to that. The proposals in this motion will not break down all of those barriers, but they do represent a proactive and positive step. And what it would mean is that the important rights for new parents within UK employment law would also be reflected for councillors at Stroud District Council. I'm sure we all agree that we want our democracy to be representative and for our councillors to reflect the communities that we serve. And the implementation of parental leave arrangements for councillors will encourage younger councillors to put themselves forward or to stay on as councillors. I hope we wouldn't want councillors to have to make the choice of either continuing as a councillor or starting a family. As it will be important to ensure that any policy is appropriate and relevant to our circumstances, the revised resolution proposes to refer this to the Constitution Working Group for further work before bringing back a draft policy for approval to this Council. Thank you. Steve, do you wish to speak now? You're a second. You wish to speak? All right. Any questions? Uh, yes, I appreciate that. It, I, I'm, I'm a bit, well, I'm, I'm concerned that we could have done something better. It's broken down the, the different levels so the government doesn't have all the control. You know, we, we want to actually um, be making district councils really worth their time, as sort of some parish councils are, that they are actually doing the best thing. So it does seem to me that we could at this moment, although you may not think so now, is that we, we need to have more you know, control at this level than the government should really put, wants us to have. I'm sorry, I'm not quite clear sorry. what the question well, is. Well, my question is, my question is, I mean, you could do another one, I agree, but I always feel that we don't, you know, we're the most, most centralised uh, government of, uh, around the Europe, and you know, there's much more done down at this level. What we've done, John. So I, I would, I John, I think the confusion I, I is because you, 
you know, it's not the time to do this, but it, it, it must be in the future so people value Gone. town and district councils, county councils. Sorry. Question. We're not in debate no, at the moment. Sorry about that. Yes. Right. I tried to explain Have you finished? It again. Do you want to? No, I won't explain it again. All right. Can you switch your mic off? Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be supporting this, but I do wonder, please, um, whether the councillor has thought through the democratic uh, dimension to uh, a councillor taking six months, or taking, being taken six months away from her constituents in terms of representation. Um, I have thought through that, yes, and I firmly believe that in line with UK employment law, um, you know, it's well established the principle that, that new mothers have time away from their paid employment and, um, you know, there are details to work out in terms of the relevant policy for this council, but I, I don't think it cuts across democratic accountability for a new parent, either a father or a mother, to take time off um, away from their elected role um, in line with the draft um, policy that was circulated earlier. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. in a three, a three ward system like we've got, if Matty decided to have another baby, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure Chris and, and I would, would cover for her. Any more questions? <laughs> Any questions now? Yes, it's Johnny. <laughs> Congratulations, Matty. <laughs> <laughs> I think what um, Nick was trying to get at was would you consider substitution on committees? Because if a member of the committee has taken six months off for um, maternity or paternity leave, would we be able to consider as a council then substituting a, another member onto that committee? I think that's the sort of detail that you could look at in the constitutional working group in relation to the policy. Um, I think that's a, that's a good point and, some, and that's the level of detail that, that could be looked at before the full policy is brought back. No more questions? Nigel? I, I thought actually what Nick was getting at really was the, in a single seat board, the, uh, the residents will won't have a, a representative of the council. So, uh, what, uh, is there any answer to that? Well, I mean, again, I think you could look at that within the policy. I'm not sure there is a, an easy answer to it. I mean, certainly in terms of the UK Parliament, there are some things that are being tried, and, and certainly during Stella Creasy's maternity leave, the, there's a very new uh, arrangement where for the first time there is somebody covering that MP uh, while she's on, on maternity leave. But I think it would be about the level of um, engagement and involvement that that councillor would, would be able to make during that, that six months leave. Debate? <laughs> Keith, Keith, you got your arm went up first, Keith. So you want to ask? Yeah, I, I, you want well, to ask a question? You just said debate. Yes, I said debate. Right. Yeah. Um, I will certainly support it, but my, my view is, of course, that currently the legislation, if it, and I think it is legislation, covers it anyway. Because fundamentally, if a councillor cannot attend meetings for six months, he has six months before he's disbarred and has to leave as being a councillor. If it's only going to be the six-month period and not an extended period, then what is the difference? as long as everyone understands that's the reason why that councillor is not attending meetings. And that councillor will be in the three wards, as, as Chairman said, will, will be able to be looked at, residents will be looked after by their colleagues. And I'm sure that in a single ward, the leader of the whatever party it is would make certain that those residents have someone that they can call upon. Well, whilst I'm prepared to support it, I just think it's somewhat unnecessary because I think as, as a council that knows, should know what it's doing and going on and be sympathetic, but it, it happens anyway and the rules are there and maybe, who knows, when the rules are originally drafted, 
that a councillor had, was not disbarred of being a councillor unless they'd missed six months of meetings, then that may be, well, one of the reasons you think about it, illness, etc. So what are we doing? If there was a difference whereby you could make it, it was meant to be a statutory nine months off, then that's different. It doesn't coincide. So what is the difference? That's what I would ask. That is a question, although we're in debate. Um, but, that's, but I thought I was missed last time. I'd get a question in this time. Um, so that's my view. I don't see there's any difference whatsoever. And I guess you're quite right, Rachel, that as part of the Constitution Working Group, there are details there we can work out about who's allowed to do what. But it doesn't really change anything as it is today, in my view, as long as you acknowledge the fact that the council isn't just absent. Stephen, you, did you put your hand up? Yes, right. Um, I, obviously, I'm support this. Actually, I did when we, we did this at County Council as well. I'm now very nervous because I was going to stand up and completely disagree with Keith. Um, I, I think one of the significant things about this, actually, is that we, put, um, we state that it's paternity leave so that people are very clear why a um, councillor may be missing from uh, full council and committee meetings. But he put that in the last sentence, so I don't have to disagree with him. Uh, and the other thing I think is um, um, worth stressing, I think um, the LGA... And I like the LJ because of the way it does work cross-party, despite accusations that I'm against all those good things. Um, and, and this has been an LJ proposal that has been supported um, and, and should be welcomed, um, regardless of, of any other things. Um, Mike, the comment I'd also like to underline, as I think we go and put this to the Constitutional Committee, is how do we cover single-seat wards? But actually, interesting, we have a real case example uh, where we've seen it in, um, in one of our wards, where um, though it's actually a multi-member ward, at some point, all three have been unable to uh, attend um, parish council meetings, and uh, partly because it was my county ward, but also because I, as a leader of the group, I've stepped in and helped cover some of that. I think some formality in that would be useful, which said it became the leader's responsibility to help to find a solution to cover that, if we could make that part of it. But not so much for committees. I think on Constitution, we're already discussing um, the potential use of substitutes at, committee, um, at committees, but at full council, and, and representing the residents whether we could use some um, mechanism there. So I welcome this, and I think there's some work to be done on it, but I think it's, it's obviously a, a good motion. Nigel uh, Cooper now. Chairman, well, I think it's all been covered. Thank you. Martin. Thank you very much, and I do strongly support this, but I'm particularly pleased about the amended motion we're looking at that it's actually going to go to the Constitution Working Group because I think there's a lot of issues that do need to be resolved that weren't, weren't really properly covered in, 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 in the initial um, resolution. And I think some of that is around um, making sure this is genuinely parental leave for both uh, uh, for, for where there's shared parenting and same-sex parents. Um, also that, uh, that it's not just about leave. I think we, it, you know, it, it is about these substitution arrangements. It's also about enabling, I hope it, that they'll also cover, enabling parents when they, do, when, when they do come back or do try to cover um, council duties, that we make it as easy as possible. That's sometimes about timing of meetings. It's also um, looking, looking at, at, at half term sometimes and other responsibilities. You know, there's a whole lot of issues that I think we really need to do because this is a serious issue. You look at the, the, the age profile here. It's not just that there aren't uh, um, women here. There's a lot of... We don't have those young parents here, and they are really important. And um, I know from, 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 from my own uh, children who, would, who, who, who now have young, young children, they uh, have, would love to be councillors, but they would find it just too difficult because of their parental responsibilities. So we need to look at this, and uh, so I'm really pleased that it's going to go to the Constitution Working Group, and, uh, and, and let's hope we get something really exciting, flexible, and um, inspirational back. Paul? Uh, yes, uh, so further to what Councillor Whiteside was saying, it is very difficult to find younger people that want to stand to be counsellors, um, especially if you're a parent or you're about to be a parent, about to give birth or whatever. Um, and we don't, we don't currently have a clear policy on this respect. Um, so we all know, because we've been counsellors for ages, that there's various workarounds that we can cobble together to get around this and sort things out. 
But if I was thinking of standing, if I was a young person with a family and I was thinking of standing in May, I wouldn't necessarily know that. So I might be put off from coming forward as a councillor because I wouldn't know what the situation was, you know, um, with respect to looking after children. So if we can put this in place, then there is a clear policy that we can hand to prospective councillors and say, don't worry, if you've, got, if you've got children, we've got a policy on that. So here it is. So don't worry about it. Please come forward. So I think this is why this, this has come through at a very opportune moment, and I will certainly be supporting it tonight. Chaz? Chair, I, I, I'm conscious, actually, that all of the debate has actually been by men, and I, I you know, I apologise for, for that. But um, I, I think, yeah, well, I know we, I, I know we are, but I, but I think, I think. Congratulating me on my pregnancy. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. I, but I think I was in question, in question. But I, I so, so, but I think, I think, I think it's really important that we that we think about the impact that this has on, on families. And I, you know, certainly, you know, those of you who know me or my late wife, a long time, she was actually a county councillor in Worcestershire, and uh, when we had very young children, I can remember being embarrassed when we were in Stirling, and she looked, they, the children looked at a fire engine going past, and said, "Mummy, there's one of your fire engines going <laughs> past." So, our, our simplistic explanation of sitting on the fire committee for the county um, meant that they, she was responsible for them all over the country. Um, but, but I think. Uh, but I think it's really important is that we actually have a good uh, constitutional working party that is actually looking at this. Um, uh, and one thing was conscious when the, the, the membership was circulated was it's a, not a very well ge gender balanced com committee. Uh, we've had a discussion in the Labour group and both Matty and myself will be nominated again to, to serve on that. But I do hope that other group leaders will give some thought to the, to the, to the balance. Can I also add to this, this issue about the, um, uh, 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 the issue about single member seats? Um, when Linda actually died, uh, because it was in the six months before an election, uh, the seat was declared vacant. And I think this may be, if we ever get to another uh, boundary review, I think it's an argument against single member wards. Because effectively, the, uh, the, the electors of Uplands were deprived of having a councillor representing them for, for, nearly, for nearly six months. And I think I, I understand the point that was being made, but that is about what the management arrangements that are made to support the, the member the member who's, who's absent for, what, for, what, for whatever reason. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it's a really good work that's been put into this, um, especially with the amended motion that's been put before us tonight. And uh, I hope we can uh, all support it. Chris. Obviously, I support this um, all heartedly. The sad thing is, Chair, what we're measuring as a council's ability is to attend a meeting. Yeah? That's what we measure the six months on, if they don't attend a meeting or a full council meeting. You forget what councillors' job really is, is working in their communities, working with their constituents, and sometimes, even if they can't attend meetings through parental difficulties, they're still carrying out ward work in their own ward. So you mustn't dismiss that out of hand. And the problem we've got is we're looking for a policy to actually protect them from attending a meeting. Now, it's not all about meetings. It's just... I support it. I'm not trying to change anything. But just let members remember, you know, being a councillor is not just about turning up at a meeting. It's about the hours. It's about the work you put in. And sometimes a young mum at home maybe might have opportunities to do casework, might do things on a coffee morning or things of that nature. They're not ruling themselves out completely for six months, just the ability to attend a formal gathering. Because that's the difficulty. You know, even if you've got caring responsibilities, you know, for, for, for partners, it's so difficult sometimes to get out at seven o'clock at night to go to a meeting. And that's the bit we've got to remember. You know, councils are not just about meetings, it's about the whole package. That's all I want to say to you. But I, 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 I support it totally. Joyner. Thank you very much, Chair. Obviously, I will be supporting this, and I'm, I'm really pleased it's coming forward. I just, um, it, it is really important that we try to examine what the barriers are to people standing, and um, this isn't about having just lots more parents on the council, potential parents. It is just about getting a diverse council. I think we value having a whole range of ages and genders and backgrounds. That's really important. So I'm very pleased to see the final part of the motion, which is referencing this toolkit that was done, the LGA and the government looked at that together. I understand it's quite 
quite a substantial document, but hopefully the group will be able to pick some important aspects out of that and bring it back to this council to say there are some good things in here which we can learn from and we can adopt. So I very much welcome, because it's only quite a small group of the Constitutional Working Group, I sort of put in a request really that you work out a way to consult with all members of the council, whether we just do a sort of little online survey or a quest out for views or talk to people. So all the members have got a way they can sort of input um, from their own personal experience or people they know considering standing for election, what the barriers and what the opportunities might be for them. So I think that would be very helpful. Um, I would also say around the, on the question of, of women as well, I think as a Labour Party, we're, our ambition is to have 50-50 candidates for this upcoming election. We're working very hard to make that happen. And I know our new MP also has been a long-time member of the 50-50 group, getting 50-50% representation in Parliament. So there's a little plea from all the other parties here. Hopefully that's something you're aiming to um, have as your ambition going forward to May as well. So when we come back in May, whoever's been elected or re-elected, we do have... Um, a 50-50% split, that would be brilliant. Not many councils have achieved that. That would be quite a great achievement for Stroud. Something for us to aim for anyway. Thank you, Chair. Nick. Uh, thank you. I absolutely agree with Chris. The, the, the ward work is a vital part of what we do. Uh, it occurs to me that, that there may be an element of this which reflects back on one of our earlier topics this evening, i.e. the remuneration committee, and maybe childcare should be something that if we don't already do it, should be included in, in their review. Yes. Cost of childcare, that is. Debbie. Thank you. I just wanted to say something to make Chaz happy as, as a woman speaking in this debate. Um, <laughs> but, sorry, Doida. But obviously, I, Nick has briefly mentioned it. And when I started on this council, I had uh, a, a young daughter, and there was a thousand pounds, up to a thousand pounds, I think. Um, from the independent remuneration panel for covering childcare costs. And I think whilst the um, Constitution Working Group are considering this, we should also be bringing that in as part of the, its sort of recruitment and that the um, childcare is the retention part of the package. So I'd ask that the Constitutional Working Group can, can bring that in as well. <coughs> Lindsay. Thank you. Um, I, I really welcome this as a parent myself to three young children. I know the struggles. Um, I'm very lucky to have a supportive husband who um, pretty much looks after the kids most of the time. Um, so I really do welcome this and I look forward to hearing a lot more about it. Steve Lydon. <clears throat> I have the right to second, so I'll do that now. Um, no, I firstly, I think, ought to say that uh, thank Ken and Martin in particular, and I know Stephen today, have looked at this, the new motion. I think the principle we're trying to do was accepted, but we're not perfect. And, uh, and therefore, I think Patrick has helped us redraft something which is acceptable to everybody. And that is important, because this is too important to get dragged into the morass of petty party politics. And I think what this is pointing to, what I talked about before, and I think it is worth a few of us sitting down and get a head round. What other ways can we make the way that this council works, it's Martin's point, about genuinely more open and, and to people from all walks of life? Is it support? Is it the t including the times we meet? You know, I was a big fan. We moved them to the evenings. We moved all the meetings to the evenings. Of course, now, fully flexible working means that a lot of people work in the evenings as well because of some of the employment practices that have been introduced. So I think after May, I think it would be worth us getting our heads around looking at the whole way that we work and the support we give to people to allow them to actually for us to recruit from the widest possible group. And to answer Keith's point, uh, Keith, you've got a point, but I think it's important that people know. I think it's also important we don't advertise the fact you don't have to come for six months, because um, I find that a pretty red, red yeah, it's a pretty <coughs> naff way of doing things, and, and I think we need to look at other ways of looking at that. So I think the principle is right to do. We were probably trying to put everything down on paper to try and get it through, but I think it is wise to actually remit a committee to have a look at it and look in all the corners and see what other pitfalls are and see what other good practices. So I commend it to you and thank very much Rachel for the work she's done on it. Any further debate? No? Rachel? 
Uh, well, thank you everyone for your comments, um, and I think there's quite a lot there for the Constitutional Working Group to ponder on. Um, just a couple of points to reflect on. I don't think, I mean, just to pick up on some of Keith's points, I don't think it is really business as usual. I mean, certainly the draft policy which the Working Group will look at talks about the potential of extending beyond six months maternity leave in certain circumstances, and I think we'd need to define what those might be um, and how that could be agreed. It particularly gives an example of where the birth is premature, that that could be extended beyond six months. That's quite personal to me as my second child decided to arrive nine weeks early. I know exactly uh, the challenges that that can, can bring. So I think there is quite a lot of detail in there. I think a lot of the comments that have been made are, are really helpful and could go forward. I'd add that perhaps one of the things the group can look at is the concept of keeping in touch days, which applies in maternity leave and might be something that would work quite well um, over an extended period of, of parental leave. So, um, yeah, I hope we're all able to support the motion. Thank you. <coughs> right. Shall we go to the vote then? Right, thank you, members. That's carried. That's the end of the... Do you wish to speak?